Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of Medisodes. Today we're going to be wrapping up our three-part series about health systems around the world and in today's episode we're going to be having a discussion all about the different advantages, disadvantages about each system, how they work currently and comparing them against each other via a series of metrics. Firstly we're going to talk about whether the current systems in place work for each nation by going through each of them one by one. I'm going to start off with the UK, which obviously has the very famous national insurance or beverage model with the NHS. So guys, what do we think? Do you think the NHS system is fit for purpose in today's Britain? I think definitely. I mean, it is definitely not perfect. No one is going to deny that. But I feel like if you look at like other healthcare systems around the world, it definitely we definitely take it for granted here in the UK, like how good our healthcare system is. And the fact that we basically, apart from a pres- couple of prescription drugs and dental service, most of it is there are no out-of-pocket payments. And that's a huge thing. Most other countries are not like that at all, even those that have government involvement. And that's a key advantage of the NHS is its affordability and accessibility in that centre that it's not um, determined by who can pay. It's determined by clinical need. It's reliant on one of the fundamental ethics of medics, which is beneficence. And it's to make sure that you're doing good to your patients for at all times. And locking treatments and medications behind paywalls means that patients may feel outpriced from healthcare and the treatment that they need and deserve. And as healthcare professionals, it's a duty to help people rather than to get money out of them. So the NHS model is very good at providing this healthcare free at the point of service to every single person in the country. Well, that being said, the free public healthcare system means that there are very high waiting times in the NHS, especially in emergency care. And this means that many people who require treatment are not able to get it on time. And this means that their medical condition could get worse. And this, in the long term, could mean that it could cost the NHS more to treat them because dealing with symptoms earlier is better than prolonging them and having them worsen over time. I would like to argue to the contrary. I feel because that it's free, um, people aren't like deterred from going to their GPs, although there is obviously the separate problem of trying to get a GP appointment. But... If you have one, you in like if the system works as it should, uh, people should be able to get the treatment they need and not feel that oh yeah, I'm wasting this money on something that's probably nothing. Because if it's free at the point of use, you're going to use it, and ultimately that's what you should not be scared to use the healthcare system. And I feel like by picking stuff up, things up early, especially stuff like cancer. If you can pick that up early, that's really beneficial. And I feel like the lack of pay boundaries is a key part of making sure that people are willing to go to their doctor or and like get stuff checked out. And sometimes that means that they check out really silly things that um, you could say are very minor, but it does overall have a positive impact. I definitely do think, though, the, the biggest problem with the NHS is that it's all a very good idea in principle. But when it's applied in the real world, there are so many problems that it suffers. And I think the main problem just simply is that it doesn't get all the services and money it needs to actually run at full capacity. Like Surya said about the wait times, there's just not enough staff, there's not enough equipment. And every year, the NHS far overblows its budget that the government gives it, even when that budget is a lot lower than what it should be. I just think that the NHS either needs a lot more government support to be able to get up to its full ideal capacity, or it needs to be reworked in some way that it will still be able to provide the services it offers, but actually be able to follow up on that with reasonable wait times. I guess that um, the fact that, I guess it's not the problem with the NHS itself and the model, the model might be sound, but I feel that the UK, although it's within the range of like, what countries spend on GDP, uh, the percentage of their GDP is on the lower side. I think it's towards 9% when like stuff, uh, countries like France are spending nearly 11, 12%. And that like small percentage difference might not be a lot. 
in in your mind not thing, but giving that extra money could help. And also, you have to look at the fact that the NHS is um, if we could look improve the NHS's efficiency, perhaps. Like for example, like up until recently, the NHS was using fax machines. They might still be doing, and that kind of like thing should not really be happening in twenty twenty one. So I feel like the NHS needs to be modernized, but I don't think that's an under that's not an excuse to like fundamentally change the system. I think the system does work well and it's worked well in the past. The NHS principle is is great. If it works as it was planned, then it's perfect. But the problem is implementing it is much harder because money is just one of the issues. Working in the NHS is seen as is becoming less and less attractive because of the harsher conditions and long working hours. Because of the lack of doctors, fewer doctors are having to do more work, which means that more doctors are feeling compelled to work in private medicine. And so another of the factors that we must consider is to attract doctors back to work in the NHS, to try and get doctors to retire later and to work to the full extent of their career rather than taking early retirement and quitting the job. Because training a doctor is a very costly process. It takes five years at least to gain a medical degree and several years after that for them to qualify and specialise in their field. So if the doctor does feel dissatisfied with the NHS and leaves, it's a very inefficient use of budget. So we need to make sure that the NHS is attractive and provides sufficient benefits for these doctors so that they stay. Also adding on to the point about doctor training, it's also expensive for the person training in medicine, like uh, paying nearly £9,000 just in tuition fees for five, maybe even six years. It's very expensive. That's a lot of debt to um, bring upon yourself if you have um, take out that student loan. And or we, you need that time to be able to train properly. But perhaps um, we should look at whether reduced fees across the board, not just in medicine, but across the board, should be implemented. For example, nearly... Um, the, Fees went from being free to being £3,000 to being £9,000. And actually in Scotland, if you're a Scottish citizen, you can still go to university for free. And I think that would definitely encourage people from to go into medicine. And Because like, thinking about having six years worth of paying that much money, is it can be a big burden for people who might feel like they can't afford that. Well, we've talked a lot about the UK system in general. So what, what do we think in like overall? Do we think, it, yes, it is fit for purpose or no? Well, my opinion is that overall, in a sense, the UK system does suffice in terms of the healthcare <laughs> it provides, just mainly because of the fact that the government provides the basic necessities of healthcare that private healthcare may not be able to provide. I think it's it's a it's a testament to the NHS that a commonly cited quote is that the NHS is the closest thing the UK has to religion. And I feel like the NHS has over the last ten years been um particularly underfunded and I feel like it is probably one of the best things about the UK. And I feel like definitely it's suited for purpose. Maybe not necessarily it should be implemented in other countries because that's a different step. But I don't think that uh, the UK should abandon this model of healthcare. I think it just needs to properly fund it and perhaps have some small tweaks in terms of maybe how trusts are structured. Because also you have to factor in the fact that it's trust, like going between trusts is very like there's not very good um collection of patient records i think they've tried to do this now by centralizing patient data uh in one place um but when you go to different hospital appointments it's very frustrating sometimes that you can't get they don't have your records which is a bit silly but even in the same trust if you go to different hospitals but hopefully with electronic health records that we've talked about on this channel before and uh, with some better integration in terms of IT, I definitely think the NHS is 
fit for purpose and I can't see any other health system in the UK. Well, we've talked a lot about the NHS, so let's pivot over to a much more different system, the one in the US. Do we really think that that works for the US right now or are there any glaring flaws with it? Well, one obvious flaw would be that many treatments are locked behind paywalls that many patients can't afford. And especially in the case of emergency treatments, this may put immense financial pressure on the patient because even in a situation where the patient has to be treated in in emergency, they're not asked whether they would like to carry on with the treatment. And this puts them in large financial debt, which they often never are able to pay off for the rest of their lives. And this stress causes an immense mental health impact on them as well. And it could be argued that the health costs of the privatised healthcare system in the US cause a negative mental health effect on patients who have been treated by it. And so I think that's one fundamental flaw behind the health system in the US. Locking treatments behind paywalls does not fit in with the medical ethic of beneficence and doing good to all patients. Instead, it focuses on profits and earnings. Definitely. I think um, if you remember back to my look at the Commonwealth report, the US ranks lowest in pretty much every category. And if we think the NHS is inefficient, The US is one of the most inefficient healthcare systems in the world. They spend the most on healthcare. I think 20% of their uh, GDP in the UK, the US is the biggest economy in the world. Yet they don't have universal coverage for everybody. Many people go bankrupt because they can't afford their medical bills. And I don't believe for a global superpower such as the US, that's good enough. I definitely think that the US, especially being such a big country uh, globally in terms of power and prestige and having such a large amount of money that it spends on its healthcare system, could really do better in terms of making it more accessible to everyone. I think the US system works wonderfully for the people who can afford it and all the rich people who can benefit from their super high level of care in their private hospitals. But for the large majority of working Americans, it just isn't fit for purpose at all. Definitely. And I feel maybe um, one of the barriers to introducing universal health care in the US, which is commonly cited, is the fact that many Americans view um, systems like the NHS or even uh, European systems as socialized medicine and social socialized or socialism. But I feel like if we could rephrase it as medicine for all or um universal health care i think that could help and politicians like bernie sanders are trying to bring in that kind of system but americans probably need to it needs to be marketed to americans in a different way yeah definitely i think a lot of how this goes across to americans is the way it's presented to their sort of society and again a lot of their society really doesn't like the idea of a socialized healthcare system that's because the politics has sort of co-opted the healthcare issue yeah but in in defense of the u.s system one of the things that does do well is innovation and i feel like um definitely the newest technologies and the newest treatments are available sooner if you can afford it in the u.s they are available much more easily than in europe and America has some amazing institutions such as um, Harvard, um, Princeton, all those amazing universities. And they create um, an amazing places like the Mayo Clinic, John Hopkins, all those amazing places. So research in America is huge. But that's also due to the fact that the pharmaceutical companies are willing to pay big bucks for this research. So it comes back to the same issue. Yeah, I definitely don't think we can discount their sort of economic clout and also just the high quality of their healthcare that they offer. It's definitely one of the things that they've got working in their favour compared to all the other sort of problems that people have with their healthcare system. So overall, what do we think, guys? Is it a fit for purpose system or not? So I would say that the, the system works in that money isn't as much of an issue compared to the healthcare system in the UK. 
But in terms of the underlying medical principles and giving treatment to everyone in terms of goodwill, it's really not the best option and it doesn't work in terms of serving the nation's needs, especially those who may not be able to afford more expensive treatment. I'll keep my opinion short and sweet. I don't think any system that does not allow the poorest in society to access it is not fit for purpose. Well, it seems like we're pretty agreed on that one. But here's another system that might have a bit more contention about it. The German system that we covered in episode one. What do people think about that one? I think the German system is the best. If we look at America and what can be made different, I think the German system would be a way. That would be easily implementable in America because I feel it's a mix. It's a hybrid between the UK and the US in terms of like it's still the government actually has very little involvement in delivering healthcare, but it definitely is still accessible and it's tightly regulated. So even though people can get private health insurance, and many Germans do, um, on top of statutory health insurance, um, I feel like it delivers high quality of care and it still um, doesn't come into the fact that the government is controlling. It's still independent of the government. I think that one of the main advantages of the German system is that it's recognised across the EU which means that for people who are always on the move, in uh, the German public health insurance is a perfect deal because in general it offers a wide coverage than most public insurance schemes um, in other countries. So Germany is part of the common European health scheme known as the, I think it's the EHIC, and this acts as as an assurance that everyone undertaking public health insurance in Germany will have their medical needs covered in each EU country. So I think that having that consistency across all EU countries is really a big advantage. So arguably, it's a benefit that the healthcare in Germany isn't 100% free to everyone, and it doesn't use a single taxpayer system. And this gives more value to the healthcare system. And it's still accessible to all the people who need it but it means that people won't be using it for unnecessary purposes. And this helps alleviate the load on the healthcare services, which means that the quality of treatment to the patients it does get is much better. Yeah, I definitely feel like the fact that there are still um, over 100 of these statutory health insurance funds, um, which are independent bodies that are quasi-government bodies, I feel it still gives Germans choice in terms of, so to meet their needs, um, they still have flexibility in that sense that the, you could argue the US system has as well, but it, you still have the affordability of many other schemes. It probably costs, it, although it's funded in a different way, it probably costs the same amount as the NHS in terms of t- um, how much a person pays towards it. So I think that the main reason why Germans pay very little for their healthcare is because most of the most of the payment is covered by the insurance provider. I think that this is a huge advantage when it comes to cutting the costs. Yeah, I I definitely feel it's a bit strange the American system. I feel if you've paid for health insurance, whether that's national insurance in the UK or statutory health insurance in Germany, it should then have very little out-of-pocket payments. And I think once you paid insurance, that should be, you should be able to access healthcare without having to pay much extra. I do definitely think that the German system is one that's really well matched to their sort of wider political and cultural systems, because obviously it is a capitalist country nowadays. And Therefore, it's not a fully socialist system. But at the same time, it does have a lot of the sort of social welfare aspects that differentiate it from a fully capitalist system than like the US, for example. But we also have to look at the fact that there are some, there's also quite bad regional inequality within Germany. So obviously, Germany has, was uh, for many years from 1945 to 1990, it was a split. Uh, between East and West, and the West was capitalist, the East was communist. And I feel like even today, 
there's definitely a, um, in the same way that in the UK, there's a north south divide. In Germany, there's the east west d- divide. And that could, um, that definitely impacts how their health, health system functions in terms of where demand is needed. So, what do we think, guys? Do we think the German system is fit for purpose or not? So, this isn't a yes or no question, really. It's more of a, it's relatively fit for purpose compared to the USA, for example, which we were set on against. But it does require more out-of-pocket payments, which possibly may outprice some people, but it's quite unlikely. And, of course, there are options for people who have more money and what wish to take private insurance, much like in England and the USA. So I think it is fit for purpose, somewhat, but not to the extent that the NHS is in the UK, in principle. So yeah, I agree with Adrian, since there are a lot of op- different options in terms of how people um, pay for their healthcare. So out-of-pocket payments, as well as private, ins- uh, private, um, private healthcare, means that there's, uh, depending on your income or social status, you have different options to go for. So I think it is fit for purpose. I would say that I would go further. I think it's probably, um, at least uh, probably prince on principles, it's not as good as the NHS. But I would say in practice, in the real world, when we look at how it functions, it's probably better than the NHS in terms of, delivering it's got very short wait times for elective surgery um it works very smoothly i think overall it's a really good system i don't think maybe the it would be acceptable to the uk public given that there are pocket payments but i definitely feel it's a really good system let's move on to some more um out there systems so this system is a lot more unique and that is singapore one we discussed in the second episode. What do people think about Singapore's system? Well, um, I think Singapore's a really intriguing system in terms of like them compulsory saving, um, medical savings accounts. I feel perhaps it's not uh, replicable in other countries because Singapore is a very small nation and therefore it can do so very differently from. Um, from other bigger nations that perhaps it doesn't need as many hospitals and it doesn't have as big a population to cater to. And I feel its population still, um, maybe the demographics is a bit younger than some other countries we've talked about, but it's definitely for Singapore, a very good system, a very interesting system. Well, I think that one of the main advantages that makes Singapore stand out from other healthcare systems is that the country's, um, public statutory insurance system, which was uh, MediShield Life, as discussed in the previous episode. And I think MediShield Life covers large bills arising from hospital care and certain outpatient treatments. So I think that um, the the existence of MediShield Life means that out-of-pocket payments are relatively smaller compared to other countries. And adding on to this, there is also relatively shorter waiting times in Singapore. For treatments, so I think that these two are major advantages. I think Singapore is a really unique example because I think it's very fit for purpose for the system it's built for, which is the Singaporean system. But I don't think it's at all replicable in any other country because Singapore's status is such a unique country. I mean, a lot of people call it the only city state left in the world. And I just don't think it's something that can be replicated, like Shrey said, anywhere else. I would definitely also say that the Singaporean um, trust in their politi- in their politicians is very also very rare. Uh, most countries probably don't have that. Like, I think the Singap- the Singapore government is less worried about uh, winning elections and stuff like that. They're quite secure in that, so they can plan for the long term as well, which is a huge advantage. While in countries like the UK. Uh, where the NHS is always a battleground, like political issue. The government's always looking short term. What can we do to win an election or like make our party look uh, good? So perhaps that's also an advantage that they have more scope for long term planning due to like security and like they'll still be in power to reap the benefits. 
So what do you guys think about Singapore's system then? Is it a successful system fit for purpose or is it not fit for purpose? So most definitely it's fit for purpose. It's got several backup options for when treatments get more and more expensive from Medisave and progressing upwards. And this means that patients and patients are covered for the majority of treatments that they'll go through and they're heavily subsidized by the government and of course it's not free public health care and it's similar somewhat to how medicare works in the us but the contributions that employ employees pay towards medisave means that they are covered in term in cases of emergency and the progressive unique system that works only in such a country is working really efficiently okay, let's talk about another one that we covered in the second episode that being switzerland in switzerland it does have a global reputation for being quite outstanding and because there are many advantages to the system because there are there is guaranteed coverage and there's also a high quality service and there's a lot of patient choice as well and there's there's no really financial worries in terms of for patients in the case of if they have catastrophic illnesses or accidents or if they have any chronic conditions and at the same time, from the point of view of the insurers, co-payments kind of help to reduce the overuse of um, services and the government also takes some measures to keep down expenses. I think uh, Switzerland's a very unique system in the way that it's pretty, it's pretty private, but it's still got a lot of uh, government oversight. And also just the structure of, so if we go to the structure of Switzerland's government, it's a bit more fragmented in terms of like having cantons and stuff like that. So perhaps in Switzerland, the integration that you have within the NHS is not possible. or by, And it is world renowned for its healthcare in terms of the quality. But I think perhaps the costs are a bit higher you pay for what you get but it is expensive i definitely think switzerland i definitely think switzerland's status as being one of the world's uh, richer nations also does benefit it in that regard because it can afford to have that sort of higher cost of healthcare for the trade off better quality because it citizens on the whole will be able to afford that higher level of care that they're offering yeah, because quality of care is, is quite important and you don't want your patients to feel uncomfortable or in any way feel like they're not benefiting from the treatment they're getting. And yes, it may seem or feel that the healthcare system in Switzerland is somewhat over the top, given that about 10% of a Swiss resident's salary goes on health insurance costs. The premiums that they pay is reflected in the health care that they get and the improved quality and cleanliness of hospitals means that the system works really efficiently and is much more effective at small things like disease control. Okay. So do we think the Swiss system is fit for purpose? I think that besides from the high administrative costs of Switzerland's healthcare system, as well as the fact that the system is, is heavily adapted to the fact that the Swiss population have quite a high income, it is fit for purpose relative to that country. So the final one that we're sort of just going to go through and talk about is going to be sort of the healthcare systems in less developed nations that we covered in the first episode. What do we think about some of the examples we saw there, like Bhutan? Maybe it depends on income. Like, there are many different scales of developing countries. You have big countries like India and China and you have smaller countries like Bhutan but I feel as long as um, maybe not in India China because of their massive population but in other countries universal healthcare coverage is possible if it's funded correctly and it probably is unrealistic for the government to completely fund the healthcare system there probably has to be some kind of out-of-pocket payment or private private sector but I think it is definitely possible to have universal healthcare. Unfortunately, it's not the case in many of these countries. I think a lot of these countries, uh, also in terms of their spending, don't have the luxury other countries have of putting all their spending into healthcare, for example, 
a lot of them have to think a lot more carefully about what they spend their healthcare on. And in a lot of cases, they simply just can't afford to give everyone healthcare, which is the state of things, but it's also quite difficult for them to balance that. Definitely. I'd say, but we also have to look at healthcare holistically as well. That the fact like stuff uh, such as the fact uh, how much food, the nutrition of the country obviously has a huge effect on its health. And many countries are agriculturally based, although may perhaps their food intake, like the amount of calories they get is not as high, well, definitely not as high as in developed countries will impact their health. And that comes into the healthcare systems as well in terms of trying to prevent disease. And obviously, we also have the fact that poor countries tend to be in uh, more hot, hotter places uh, across the equator and sub-Saharan Africa. And that also leads to even uh, more challenges such as uh, malaria and dengue, which we've talked about before, and that adds further challenge. Yeah, so you make an interesting point about how holistically healthcare is generally worse in developing nations with regards to living conditions, diet, nutrition, and whatnot. And in terms of the healthcare systems, this probably means that there should be a greater load on these systems. The lack of awareness about some healthcare issues means that people might not realise that an issue is present, and means that people will avoid the avoid taking healthcare altogether. And in some countries where healthcare is private, uh, privatised for decent service, that that's even more of an issue of pricing out patients because in developing nations people don't have as much money and it means they won't be able to afford the health care no matter what. Well, I think that developing nations cannot have the same type of health care system as, developing con- as, as developed countries because they do face quite a unique set of uh, health care conditions that the Western countries do not typically face. For example, non-communicable diseases are more common in developed countries, whereas in developing countries it's more about communicable diseases and preventing the transmission of them. So I think that the healthcare systems in developing countries do need to be tailored according to what challenges they are facing. Okay, so now we're going to go on to a section all about sort of comparing each one via different metrics so the first one we're going to compare all these systems that we talked about is by fairness so which system do we think is the fairest we're going to have everyone say their opinion and a short reason why um well i think it's kind of obvious this one is the nhs because it's the only one where that it was the one with the least out-of-pocket payments it's funded through general tactics taxation which in theory should mean it's more fair and um, yeah, I think this is a clear open goal. Yeah, I also agree with Trey on this point. I think it is the NHS, simply due to the fact that in terms of distributive justice of the resources that it, it has, it provides a more equitable distribution of resources due to the fact that it's publicly funded. So yeah, it is the NHS. So I'm going to play devil's advocate here and, and argue against that somewhat. So I do see your argument. I would argue that a social insurance system where people people pay for a compulsory insurance is fairer that because it means that people are more aware of what they're paying for and they are unlikely to make use of the healthcare system unnecessarily, which reduces load and means that waiting times in these countries for essential treatments are much, much shorter. And taking Germany and Switzerland as our examples, the quality of healthcare there is also better though of course more expensive in terms of the money they take. So I could argue that the healthcare system there is fairer in terms of waiting times. But I would add to Adrian's point that there is a fine line between unnecessarily using a healthcare system and being scared to use it for fear of uh, cost. We need to make sure that people aren't just, people with serious diseases or conditions that can be prevented early are not um, discouraged from using the healthcare system at the same time as making sure that it's not overused. So it's more of a balance between making people aware of when they should use the healthcare system and making sure that healthcare isn't being priced out of anyone, as is the case in the US, which I think we can all agree is quite unfair in its delivery of health. 
think we've all had a pretty clear consensus about which countries come out on top in fairness. But let's talk about level of care. What country do we think has the highest level of care available who can treat the sort of most difficult medical conditions? Again, this comes, it's linking into fairness, but in a different way. In fact, that if we look at the pinnacle of what can be delivered, I think the US and perhaps Switzerland come out on top in terms of if uh, money is no object, then I think these countries provide the best technology, the best doctors, the best treatments. But if we look at quality of care from affordable quality of care, what people can actually like access, I think that brings into um, uh, brings into place a systems like Germany, like the UK, where maybe like the maximum healthcare you can get is not as good, but the realistic healthcare you get is probably better. So I would argue that, I would argue for two countries really. One I'd say is Switzerland, solely due to the fact that the higher level of money available to citizens in that country allow them to access better quality healthcare. And I would also say Germany for reasons of consistency across the healthcare system as the, their citizens can access healthcare in any EU country. So I think that consistency can also help improve the quality of the care that they get. Definitely, I would agree with Sri's point. I think that you can look at like, if you look at healthcare tourism, I think Switzerland and the US are definitely the place that you go if you want to have the best treatment in the world. This is a slightly more controversial opinion, especially because the accessibility to this care isn't always great. But I think the US has to stand out as having some of the best level of care, simply because of its super powerful research institutions that are able to develop cutting edge sort of treatments and uh, medical procedures for almost every type of illness known. They really are the sort of pioneers for discovering the limits of medicine. And while that isn't always made available to their citizens, I definitely think it puts them in the running for having the best level of care. I think that depends on how you define level of care. Because, as you mentioned, it's level of care, I think, would be about what the citizens get directly, rather than how healthcare overall is being developed and medicine as a science is being furthered. And yes, of course, it's, it's definitely a good thing that the US has such cutting-edge research, but I wouldn't group that under level of care, but rather I'd group that in a separate category of, of innovation, which arguably is less important in the short term, but obviously is very important in the long term. And another thing with innovation in the US is that these treatments will become available elsewhere eventually. And especially in developing nations like, sorry, especially in developed nations like the UK and Germany and Switzerland, where money is less of an issue in comparison to developed, developing countries, these new treatments will be made available there soon as well, which means that the level of care of the patients benefiting from these new treatments will arguably be the same in both the US and other countries. Yeah, definitely. And something we haven't touched on is the fact that the NHS gives the UK um, a really big leverage. Given that the NHS dominates the healthcare market, is that it can um, negotiate better prices than perhaps if they had a more fragmented system and that does lower cost although we every single intervention still has to go through um, NICE which is the National Institute for Care Excellence so it is a two-edged sword um, in terms of cost. Okay and on that point I think we've really covered in a lot of depth our own opinions on all these healthcare systems and definitely compared them to each other as well. And on that point, we're going to wrap up today's episode. Thank you so much for listening and make sure to like, comment and subscribe and share the video if you found it interesting to all your friends and family. Once again, thank you for watching. We upload every Friday, so be sure to tune in for next week's episode. Thank you for listening and goodbye.